uh, getting you guys started off on, on R and XCMS, um, and, and hopefully we'll be able to use some of that uh, work you, you've done. Uh, if not, we've got some other data sets for you to play with. Um, so uh, standard shots here. So we're going to do a background in statistical methods. And this one, um, based on feedback we've had for a number of years, um, is, is one of the modules I think people uh, appreciate uh, a lot. Um, and of course, there's al always ways of making it better. Um, but it is um, a way of, of starting to understand statistics, because most of us haven't really had a lot of formal training in statistics. Uh, this is just a reminder of our schedule. We're on day two. We've already done the LCMS analysis. We'll do the background in statistics, and then we'll jump into MetaboAnalyst. And, and it's sort of a, a bit of a walk-through lab, although I'll be trying to shepherd people along for that. So it's a little different type of lab. And then we'll just talk about some of the applications um, towards uh, the last, last module. So this is really a review of statistics, um, and it's trying to cover uh, essentially about two years of statistics, uh, university statistics, in, in an hour and a half. Um, but uh, we'll try and get you acquainted with a few things and try and give you, a, I think, a more intuitive understanding of, of statistics. And that's important, because uh, otherwise it's just crunching numbers and the numbers will quickly become meaningless. So we're going to, I think, the critical thing with statistics is learning about distributions and measures of significance. Then we're going to move to what are standardly called univariate, single variable count statistics. Uh, we'll also talk about correlation, which is tied to that, and clustering. And then we'll move to the last part, which is multivariate statistics, which is what people traditionally use a lot of in, in metabolomics. But all of these, both univariate correlation analysis, clustering, and multivariate are all part of the same thing. And you'll see that when, when you guys do some work on, on MetaboAnalyst. In terms of statistics, I think there's some great quotes uh, that I've seen. Uh, the best one of all uh, is by Benjamin Disraeli. He was a British prime minister uh, who was trying to deal with data that they were getting from various sources in the 1800s. And his comment was, there are three kinds of lies, lies, damned lies, and the worst of all, statistics. Uh, another one I think is also pretty legitimate. 98% uh, of all statistics are made up, which is also made up. But, um, And then this other one by uh, Aaron Levenstein, uh, statistics are like bikinis. What they reveal is suggestive, but what they conceal is vital. And often this is this, this thing with not explaining how the statistical methods are done. Uh, or what's being used, or some of the assumptions built into them has been a, a real problem. Uh, my view, uh, having played around with statistics for a long time, is essentially statistics is, is a, a formal way, or a formalized way, of describing impressions. And many of us are able to see impressions and gather impressions, and it's, we have intuition, this is right, this is wrong, this is different, this is bigger, this is smaller. Um, but that's a qualitative view, and, and statistics makes it quantitative, it formalizes it. Um, and usually your impression or your gut is right, but to just put this in a grant or in a paper and say, my gut says this is the way it is, they're not going to accept it. So they want to have uh, my gut with a p-value of 0 0.05 says this is right, and then they will accept that. So um, that's the premise. Uh, we'll, we'll dive into uh, distributions and significance, because this is sort of underlying all of statistics. So the first thing that you typically have to deal with is, is, is a distribution over uh, a population. And it might be a single variable that you're looking at in this population. And this population, a bunch of people, I don't know, 30 or so, um, and we could choose something, uh, a variable like height. And so if we were looking at the height of this population, uh, we would be doing or assessing univariate statistics. We could also measure uh, weight. That's another single variable. Uh, the scores they got on some kind of test. 
uh, their intelligence. Each of those is a variable, each of them is assigned to this individual. That is the essence of univariate statistics. So single variable, measuring a single variable over a population, and if you measure that variable, let's say the height of those people, over that subset or the entire population of 7 billion, um, and measuring the frequency of that variable, again height, you will get a distribution. And the distribution will look like this. That's a bell curve, or a normal distribution, or a Gaussian distribution. And it, it's a pretty remarkable thing, and it was picked up by Carl Friedrich Gauss, but almost every biological uh, measurement, every physical measurement we make, uh, if we collect it over a large enough sample, will follow this same distribution. Uh, there's going to be something that is trending towards the middle, and then there'll be outliers, and they have this rather smooth shape, especially if the sample set is large enough. So the normal Gaussian distribution uh, is symmetric. It has an average value, and it has a width. And the width can vary depending on circumstance or the type of measurement. Uh, but that width is called the standard deviation, or, or sigma. And as I said, it is the most common distribution known because we've seen it in every biological or physical measurement that's been done, or most of them that have been done. As I said before, the more measurements we take, um, the more normal or smooth that curve will be. If we take a very small number of measurements, perhaps if we took the height of people in this room, we'd find that it is not terribly normal looking, because uh, we're dealing with 18, 19 people. To get a good distribution, the rule of thumb is you need about 30 or 40 samples. And that's, I could say that's intuition, but that's observation, and it's something that's um, been used and is used and should be used when you're thinking about uh, the type of experiments you want to do. Uh, it's also one of the reasons why classes uh, in elementary and junior high school typically have about 30-odd students, and why we try to aim for enrollments near 30 to 40, because it gives us a, enough of a sampling to know whether we're getting or will get a, a reasonably normal distribution, something that's not skewed. Um, many clinical experiments use the same subset of 30 controls, 30 cases, Again, that's this issue of trying to get enough to get a, a reasonably normal or Gaussian distribution. So it was Carl Friedrich Gauss uh, who actually came up with the equation that described the normal or Gaussian distribution. And so this is this xy plot, and basically it's e to the minus x squared. It's the essence of it, and so we're plotting x, and, and in this case we're probably P of X or Y. There's some factors that are involved there. Uh, you can see the standard deviation, that's sigma. You can see mu, that's mean. Um, the variance, which is sigma squared, that's also up there. Um, so that value 1 over square root 2 pi sigma is sort of a, a normalization constant, a scaling factor. And you'll hear me use the word normalization, normal, scaling, sort of interchangeably. And it's an unfortunate uh, case in, in the English language that these are used probably to mean some very different things. But anyways, there's a scaling factor there. What's marked off are segments uh, in terms of the normal distribution, the, the width. And so plus or minus one sigma covers 68% of the area under the curve. Plus or minus 2 sigma covers 95% of the curve. Plus or minus 3 sigma covers about 99% or more. At the center of the curve, uh, the height um, corresponds to the mean. And the mean is also something we all know how to calculate anyways. Take the average, so it's the average height, 
or cal calculate all the heights, divide by the number of heights you've measured, come up with an average or mean height. The variation is, or variance is, is more a measure of how different or how much does the height vary. If someone's in this room is five foot two, another person in this other room is six foot two. Um, our variance is not simply five foot two to six foot two. It's it's a variance which is again measured in inches, and it would wouldn't be twelve inches. It would be more like uh, let's say six inches. Um, and then the square root of that variance, uh, which is about two and a half. Uh, is our standard deviation. Um, so this again reiterates what I was just saying about the, the, the amount of the area that's covered uh, when we measure these um, standard deviation groups, the amount of cu the curve or area under the curve going from one sigma, one standard deviation, two sigmas, three sigmas, uh, four sigmas all the way up to five sigmas, uh, which is very extreme. Um, but the two sigma one is significant, and I'll, I'll talk about that a little later. Um, so that one standard deviation or one sigma, um, the probability that something is more than one standard deviation away from the mean so if our average height for people in this room or that population that I was showing there is, let's say it's five foot seven, so we've got men and women, so it kind of comes up there, then uh, if our standard deviation was, was three inches, then about a third of the population would be above um, one sigma, so above five foot ten, and a third of the population would be below uh, five foot four. The area of the curve is equal to 1. The entire curve, yes. Now if you're looking at two sigmas, two standard deviations, uh, if the average height was 5 foot 7 and our standard deviation was 3 inches, then um, that's 6 inches, so that's uh, how many people are above 6 foot 1, be 5% of the group, then how many people are below uh, 5 foot 1, again, there'd be, uh, or 2.5%, 2.5% of the group. 3 sigma, almost no one uh, would be above or below the three sigma, uh, especially with this population here, because 0.3% is one in uh, 30, um, or actually one in 300, and we don't have a population of 300. One way I think that's probably a little easier uh, to remember all of us have gone through school, university, some of us have been in very large classes, and when you have the very large class, we all have to follow, at least the profs, have to follow this normal distribution. And uh, our deans and chairs tell us uh, the average grade that we're going to hand out in a class of 400 has to be C. So that means if you're within that um, group, roughly 68% uh, under that curve, you're going to get either a C or C minus, C plus, maybe a little bit higher, a little bit lower. If people score one standard deviation above that uh, average score for a test overall, then we're supposed to give them a B. And if they get two standard deviations above, uh, we're supposed to give them an A. Likewise, one standard deviation below um, the mean or average, they're supposed to get a D, two standard, it's an F. Um, so that's classic grading to the curve, and, and that measurement of standard deviations essentially is if you are getting an A, uh, it's, you're in the top roughly 25 to 5%. Um, so that is also the basis, this concept of standard deviation and essentially the two sigma, uh, where we I have this idea of the, what's called the p-value. Um, and this is um, the probability of, of getting uh, a particular score or a particular uh, measure or um, to reach some, some um, extreme if you want. Um, so 
0 0.05 is essentially a 5% probability that this particular measure could be achieved. Um, so in statistics, we have either accepting or rejecting a null hypothesis. Um, so we reject the null hypothesis when the p-value is less than um, 0 0.05, which is the usual uh, value we often use. Sometimes you use 0 0.01. Um, if that null hypothesis is rejected, then we can say this result is significant, it's statistically significant. Um, the choice of an alpha is actually pretty arbitrary. Um, it's, uh, if, if significance is absolutely critical, um, life or death situation, you might want to have uh, a, an alpha that's 0 0.000001. If it's uh, something that, uh, you know, is it going to be a good day or a bad day, maybe the significance uh, 0.2 is okay. And so there are lots of people who will, uh, you know, die on their sword because the alpha came out or the significance level of their t-test p-value was 0 0.06. And they'll say, the whole thing is insignificant, let's toss it all out, the experiment's a failure. Uh, which is absurd. Um, and as I say, this is an arbitrary value that's been chosen almost by convention. Um, so that's, that's an important issue. Uh, a lot of people don't really um, acknowledge or, or even accept, but this is a, it's a value that's, that's somewhat arbitrary, and the value of 0 0.05 is convention, uh, but it is uh, something that, that can be changed uh, to suit your circumstances, actually. So I was giving the example of, of height, uh, and in, say, a population of 30, 40, or 50 people, men and women, typically the average height, when you take both men and women, is about 5 foot 7. We could say that the standard deviation in that group might be 5 inches. Um, you can use things like um, both the normal distributions, probabilities, um, shape of the normal distribution curve, and if we use this significance or alpha of 0 0.05, uh, you know, what's the uh, chance of finding someone who is more than six foot ten? And so you can construct a hypothesis that anyone who's over six foot ten isn't actually human; they're a giant or something like that. So, uh, it, you know, given this null hypothesis uh, of 0 0.05, is someone who at six foot eleven are they a member of the human species? Um, at that alpha, um, uh, you probably um, wouldn't uh, assume that they are members of the human species, but if you chose an alpha of 0 0.01, uh, you could. And so by choosing a different cutoff, uh, you can make an assertion um, of whether they are members of the human species or not. Um, same sort of thing with coin flips. You could do the same sort of statistics. Um, if you flip coins, uh, ideally if it's not a, an unbalanced coin or something that hasn't been tricked or fixed, um, you could start asking the question, if I flipped a, a coin and I got heads 70% um, of the time, or 14 out of 20 times, um, is the coin fair? And so we can calculate the, the odds of this thing happening, and so the odds of this happening is 0 0.058. If we choose um, an alpha of 0.05, uh, we might conclude that the coin is not fair, but if we use an alpha of 0.1, we conclude the coin is fair. Um, so again, the threshold you choose can, can ch change, and, and it's one that you have to be explicit about. And sometimes you might have to justify it, um, um, and, and I can, it just goes back to this point about statistics is the math or mathematics of impressions. So we'll still use the value of 0 0.05 for future discussions, um, but remember it can be different for different circumstances.
So the other thing that we have to remember and think about uh, is how distributions change. The Gaussian or normal distribution is actually a, a, a symmetric distribution, but many distributions are not. And when a distribution isn't, um, then we have to use other descriptions to talk about the center or middle points. And this is where we come up with terms called mean, median, and mode. So in a Gaussian distribution, the mean, median, and mode are all the same. And so that's why most of us only know what the definition of mean is, and most of us don't know what a median or a mode is. If you have a skewed distribution, uh, which is not uncommon, you have to use these three terms. So a mean can be calculated in a skewed distribution. Again, it's just the sum of all values divided by the total. But if you have some extreme values, something very large, something very small, it can kind of mess up that distribution. Uh, the mode is the most common value. So that would be the one, in this case, the top of the, the distribution, the thing at the top, or the most, the column or uh, segment that has the largest values or numbers with values. And then by definition, the median is halfway between the mean and the mode. Um, or usually halfway between. So it's considered the middlemost value. Some distributions will just have a single peak. Other distributions will have two or three peaks. Uh, a single peak distribution is called unimodal, one with two peaks, bimodal, you can get trimodal distributions. Uh, you don't want to see those, uh, bimodal or trimodal, it says there may be something uh, uh, inherently unique or different about your distribution or how you're measuring things. Um, and in particular, if you're trying to do statistics, uh, almost every statistical test is based on working with a unimodal distribution. So the Gaussian distribution, uh, as I said, or the normal distribution is, is the most common one, but there are others that you will encounter. Um, the coin flipping is actually a binomial distribution, and coin flipping taken to an extreme follows a Gaussian distribution. Um, statistics involving relatively rare events um, um, things like mutations along a DNA strand, or uh, in the case when the Poisson distribution was originally developed, it was actually uh, the number of soldiers dying from horse kicks per year in the Prussian army, uh, follows an exact Poisson distribution. Um, in BLAST scoring for sequence alignment, uh, the extreme value distribution is, is followed, and that's typically a skewed or semi-exponential distribution. So the binomial distribution um, is, as I said, if you take that to the extreme, uh, will generate essentially a Gaussian distribution. Um, but for small numbers, and you're dealing with events like a coin flip, a two-state binomial, um, you can actually calculate what these things will be. And it's all it's done, in, or all it you need to do is just take um, probabilities of x, probability of y, or p and q, and, and then uh, take the number of occurrences that you're going to sample, n times. So p plus q to the n. And taking the coefficients of uh, that uh, polynomial. So p plus q to the zeroth power is by definition 1, so the coefficient is 1 p plus q to the first power gives you p plus q. The coefficient of p is 1, the coefficient of q is 1. p plus q to the second power yeah. gives you 1 plus 2pq, not 1p squared plus 2pq plus q squared, so you get a 1 to 2 to 1. p plus q to the third power, you get pq plus uh, 3p squared q plus 3q squared p plus q cubed. And again, the coefficients are 1, 3, 3, 1. Plotting the coefficients gives you this distribution. As n gets larger and larger, you start seeing that, in fact, the, the curve or the plot of the coefficients follows something that looks a little bit like a Gaussian. And if we went from n to about 30, 
you would see that it looks very much like a Gaussian curve, which is where that rule of 30 comes. And then taking it to you know infinite degree produces the, the Gaussian equation, e to the x or minus x squared. Poisson distribution, as I say, is, is essentially statistics of rare events. And when, um, especially the value of mu, uh, which is sort of the expectation value, gets sufficiently large, more than about 5 or 10, the Poisson distribution becomes the Gaussian distribution. But when it's very small, it becomes essentially an exponentially decaying function, and then in between it has these other variations. So it is used in the statistics of relatively rare events, um, and it trends and changes depending on the size of mu. The extreme value distribution um, is the one that's used to try and assess scores in BLAST or MASCOT uh, when you're looking at uh, proteomic uh, data analysis. It's also the distribution that should be applied to uh, university classes, but it isn't. So the point is that at the university you're supposed to take uh, the students who have typically the top 20 or 30 percent of high school students and then you put them in the first year and so that's sort of what we're doing here. Uh, the assumption was that then you take your top 20 or 30 percent of the class or high school class that they should follow a normal distribution. They won't. They'll follow this distribution. Um, that is, is called uh, an extreme value distribution. So it's effectively skewed. Um, and in the case of universities, it's probably skewed to the right. Uh, if you're choosing jockeys, uh, horse racing, you probably skew it to the left for, for people who are short. Um, but either way, uh, you've created a skewed distribution. Um, and you will typically find with these some very, very extreme values. Um, and uh, in the case of universities, you'll find these uh, kind of super geniuses like you find in the Big Bang Theory, um, guys with uh, IQs that are sort of off the chart. So those are the ones that the extreme outliers that you'll typically get if you have that. And trying to assess them is sometimes challenging, and this is why extreme value statistics was, were, were developed. So you can fix skewed distributions, um, one by sampling more frequently, um, broadening them, but the other thing you can do is it's a mathematical fix, um, which is to um, uh, convert them through a, a log transformation. And if you talk to statisticians, that's their favorite thing to do. They always talk about log scores. Everything is converted quickly to a log. They can do logs in their head um, because for them it, it allows them to take what used to be kind of messy distributions and convert them into a normal distribution. The reason why you want to convert things into a normal distribution is because essentially all of statistics was designed to handle normal distributions. And anything that's not a normal distribution, most statistics falls apart. And that's important to remember. So on the left is an example of a skewed distribution. Um, this would be probably, uh, typically it's measuring intensity data from microarray experiments. Uh, and linear intensity scales, photomultiplier tubes, um, tend to produce sort of this skewed thing. It's also sort of the way our eyes work, also the way our ears work too. Um, if you log that, take the values, you can convert this skewed distribution, which looked something like an extreme value distribution, and boom, it's a normal distribution. Now you can do statistics on it. Try to do it with the skewed distribution, try to do t-tests and other things, uh, it won't work so well. This is a, some example of actually some real data taken from, I also believe, a microarray experiment. And here's log transformations. and they're not perfect uh, Gaussians, but you can see that they are more like a bell curve on the right than the ones that were on the left before taking the log. Uh, 
And in real life situations, that's often as good as you can do to try and get a real Gaussian distribution. Okay, so that's uh, univariate statistics, that's distributions, and it's talking about means, medians, and, and other things. So why do we want to talk about that? Well, we do this because we want to be able to distinguish between two or more populations. So almost every metabolomics experiment you will do, or attempt to do, or you are currently doing, probably involves trying to distinguish between two populations. Something where it's treated, not treated, sick, healthy, um, uh, growing under this condition, growing under that condition. So in this case we're looking at two populations, uh, normal people and leprechauns in green. And if you've ever read about leprechauns, usually they're supposed to be short, and so the question is, is there a difference between the height of the normals and the leprechauns? So we could plot out the population, their height, and a curve, and we're going to generate the normal one in the light blue, and the green one, the leprechauns, in, in, on the left. The question we ask statistically is, are they different? Intuitively, everyone would be able to say yes, but can you give me a quantitative measure? Can you say how confident you are in that? Let's make it a little harder. Uh, in Southern Ireland, there's a large collection of, of tall leprechauns. Uh, and if we're wanting to distinguish between the two, are they different? So if we plotted that out, we'd see that the curves actually overlap uncomfortably more than we expect. So the question there is, are they different? How many people think they're different? How many people think they aren't different? And this is where you'd have essentially a difference of opinions and how you settle that and how and what sort of rules do you use. So this is where statistics comes in. And this is called the student's t-test. Um, it was developed more than 100 years ago. Most people just call it the t-test, but it, it was developed to determine if two populations are different. Uh, the null hypothesis is, are the, what's the probability that the two sample means are the same? And if you reject the null hypothesis, then they are different. So if you calculate the t-statistics, and I'm not going to show you how it's done, because it's done, you can do it on Google, you can do it on any calculator, so it's, it's not worth it. But if you calculate the t-statistic um, and you get a p-value of 0.4, and if you're alpha, that's your threshold, you've decided is 0 0.05, then the t-statistic says two populations are the same. If you do the t-statistic and you get a p of 0 0.04 and you're cut off, that you've chosen by convention to be 0 0.05, then you can say the populations are different. You could have chosen a p-value of 0 0.01 or 0 0.06, that, that is the alpha you've chosen, and Depending on your choice, you could say they're different or, or they're not. So this is where this arbitrariness of, of the alpha um, comes in. Now there are both paired t-tests and unpaired t-tests. Most of the things that you would be doing are for unpaired t-tests. Um, however, if you are doing some temporal series before and after, then you are supposed to do a paired t-test. That's the rule. You can actually use a t-test also uh, to look at clusters of data. Uh, so if you're familiar with PCA plots or something like that, uh, here are two clusters. And in essence, these follow normal distributions or reasonably normal distributions. And so you could use a t-test to quanti quantitatively measure how different they are uh, or how close they are, these two populations. Um, so it's a matter of just sort of mixing the variables appropriately. <coughs> what if the distributions aren't normal? As I said, the whole t-test was developed with the assumption, and essentially the essence of all of statistics were developed with the assumption that distributions were normal. So here's some messy looking distributions, they're almost bimodal. What do you do? Um, the trick here is called the Mann-Whitney U-test or it's also called the Wilcoxon rank sum test. 
Has anyone heard of these before? A few? Okay. Anyways, if the populations are not normally distributed, um, then you can use this. So it is technically a more powerful test. And in this case, it's not the means, but it's the medians that you're calculating. So that's the, the, the hypothesis you're testing. The U-test is what you're measuring, not the T-test. Um, so the U-test, if you get a P of 0 .0, 0 0.4 and your alpha is 0 0.05, then the two populations are the same. And if the U-test gives you 0 0.04 and your, your chosen alpha is 0 0.05, then the populations are different. So same concept as the t-test, but it is a different statistic, and it's used when the distributions are kind of messy. Okay, so that's for two populations. What if you've got three populations? So that's the normals, the leprechauns, and then the elves, and you want to measure them? The question is, are they different? Again, intuitively, you can say they're all different, yes, and there's a clear height difference. We go to a different collection, we've got normals, leprechauns, and a, a very tall population of elves, and we now get something that's, again, merged. What can we use to uh, use to distinguish between them? And the answer in that case isn't the t-test, but it's called analysis of variance, ANOVA. And so that's a generalized version of the t-test, and that's for three or more. It could be five populations, a hundred populations. <laughs> uh, it's, it's general. Um, and we can look at the group variation, or group standard deviation, uh, and determine whether the means are equal or not. So that's the null hypothesis again. Formally, we call it F measures. There are one-way, two-way, three-way, ten-way ANOVAs. The one-way ANOVA is the most common one. We're just trying to figure out if any of those three or more populations is different. It's not necessarily identifying which pair is different. So we're just trying to find the outlier population. That's the one-way ANOVA. So you can also use ANOVA in clustering analysis and determine whether uh, any of these three clusters are sufficiently different, uh, as long as the clusters follow a reasonably normal distribution. So there is a formal structure that you could use to distinguish among clusters or groups. So this is a little different than what you might have on your slides, but um, we've had a number of people ask over the years about this issue of how to deal with multiple tests. So uh, yes, you may have two populations, but multiple variables. Uh, so you end up doing lots of t-tests, pairwise t-tests. Uh, and that's not uncommon. Um, and uh, you might have uh, two populations and uh, 100 different metabolites uh, that you're measuring, so you're doing 100 different t-tests. Um, and we use the p-value or the alpha value of 0.05. Um, what's the odd that some of these things are, are going to, findings are going to be false, and it's almost certain that uh, something that has a value of 0.05 will be false. Could be several that will be false. Uh, to make sure that you're not going to uh, mess up, uh, there's a thing called the Bonferroni correction, which says you're going to have to take all of your t-test values um, and divide by the number of t-tests that you've performed. So 100 metabolites that you've measured. Um, in order for that set to be significant, you're going to have to find a metabolite that's different um, that has a p-value of less than 0 0.0005. Um, to put that in, I guess, uh, more realistic terms, if we were talking about this class, and we wanted to identify uh, someone who was, um, let's just say they're taller than normal, we'd have to have someone in this room who's 8 feet. Um, to say that we found someone who was taller than normal. And that is pretty extreme. In fact, I've never seen an eight-foot person in my entire life, so you know, I've probably seen hundreds of thousands of individuals. So in many cases, people believe that Bonferroni correction is way too extreme, and it is. 
uh, and in large part it's been discarded as a technique. And so what people tend to use is a thing called a false discovery rate or an FDR method. This is just an example of a, using a Bonferroni correction, uh, which is in weather, um, where if you sum, I think, most of the probabilities here, there's something will happen tomorrow. So yes? Question about the false discovery rate. It's totally dependent on the number of results that reach significance according to the facts and the p values. What if I've done a test with a thousand observations and I only found <coughs> three under 0 0.05, then the false discovery rate test would be Whereas the Bonferroni would be using a strength, I agree with you. So, how do you decide? Is my question. One or the other. Is it based on what your God tells you that three is too little, so you should use something more stringent, or how do you justify? It? Yeah, to some extent, you, you have to use uh, some human intuition. Formally, the way that the false discovery rate model is, is, is done is you, you actually look at the, the distribution of your p-values over all 1,000. And the p-values um, if you had your 1,000 you might have, well in this case it was just 3 that were 0 0.05 and then you might have had, uh, well who knows, you could have had 10 at 0 0.02 and a bunch Smaller, smaller, smaller. Um, or you may have had something way like here, uh, with most of them at p at 1. Um, that's a very unusual distribution, and a lot of FDR tests would probably choke <laughs> seeing something like that. The normal uh, occurrence is that you'll see something that looks more like this that it, it tends to go down like this over time as it spread out from 0.05 to say 1.0. Um, and if you were saying that you had mostly a thousand values, maybe it would flat out, flatten out something like this. The essence of an FDR is to just draw a line here. And this is the correction you would have. These are the ones that are likely to be false. Any ones above this are likely to be real. So if there were three, this would be about one, so two of them probably are real. Um, you can have situations where they're all the same. It's just flat. In that case, these are all fake, or they're, they're not, they're false. Um, so that's sort of the, say this is more typical, this is a case where what you're measuring is mostly nonsense. So you know, if you're trying to understand uh, the TCA cycle and the metabolites that you're measuring are all, all the metals, um, Metals have nothing to do with TCA metabolism, so you probably get something like this flat distribution. It's, you're not measuring the right thing. Um, but if you're measuring something relevant, some metabolite in the TCA cycle, and you're seeing that you know, some of them were more significant and others just weren't, um, then it might say, okay, this is where the perturbation is, or this is what's, what's, what's relevant. So this is where intuition is. If you are measuring, it's, you know, like looking for your lost keys, um, and you go to the Antarctic because you think you've put your keys there because you've never been there. That's a silly thing to do. So intuition says, you know, look for your lost keys where you have been. Um, so that's where I think it, it's, it's relevant, uh, where intuition is important. So, yes. It's kind of an inflection point. Uh, it's sort of like when you have a log curve and you try and choose the point where it turns over. So that's it's roughly what's done. Um, 
the bond Ferroni correction, just going back, is something that you could have used in this one where we say like that's 14 weather predictions and which one is the most significant one, the only one that is significant, which is 0 0.05 divided by 14, which would be less than, I don't know, 0.002, is the eclipse. So using that rule, the only thing that is uh, statistically significant is the prediction for the eclipse. Um, those are, uh, again, intended to show sort of the extremeness of, of the von Ferroni correction. The, an FDR measure, which this one is sort of simplified, um, is let's say you had 100 different t-tests, but let's say you had a p-value, most of them were, you know, 20 were below 0 0.05. Some of them you would expect to have a false positive, and you can estimate how many of those might typically be in a normal situation. And so that would be one test. So um, to correct for that, rather than dividing by 100, we only divide by about 20. And so uh, the new FDR corrected or adjusted p-value, and it's also called the q-value, would be 0 0.05 divided by 20. So that's not as bad as 0 0.05 divided by 100. So that's, that's why the FDR is a softer criterion, and it's also a more reasonable criteria. And so this is a, an approximate one. It's sort of the back of the envelope one. It's not the one, it's not the way you do it mathematically. Uh, R would have a, an algorithm to do this more accurately. And it would look at the distribution of all of the p-values and, and figure, figure that out. Okay, so that was a little bit of a segue or sideways discussion on, on, on p-values and significance with multiple t-tests. I'm going to talk a little bit about scaling and normalizing. So, uh, as I say, they have an unfortunate dual use, because some people will say, can you normalize your distribution? That means, can you make it into a normal distribution? Some people will say, can you scale your distribution? Well, that means, can you move or multiply things by a scaling factor? Um, so, as I say, it's a little confusing. Um, anyways, we had two populations, and let's say that one of our rulers was miscalibrated. We got a bad ruler, um, and we found that things were, were um, off. But, you know, initially we get this clear separation, so even though to my eyes, these look like identical populations. Somehow, because we messed up with our ruler, our scaling, one population looks a lot taller than the other. If we fix our ruler, realizing it's off by 10%, we get a more reasonable distribution. So this is correcting for if you want a systematic error. So an example of a systematic error in, in metabolomics is a dilution effect. Uh, this is common in urine analysis, but it could also be common in any tissue preparation where you've diluted or you didn't weigh out things or you didn't consider hydration or water content in, in the sample when you calculated the mass. So this, quote, normalizing or rescaling uh, is, is obviously critical. As I said, normalizing or scaling can have multiple meanings. So when I say I normalize things uh, for distribution, it means make it into a Gaussian distribution. Uh, if I can say rescale or normalize, sometimes that just means make it so that the total sums to one or so that it's appropriately uh, adjusted for dilution. Um, at least when it comes to normalization, I've already mentioned this importance of the log transformation and, and to make things look as close to a, a, a log or a Gaussian distribution as possible. So that, that is something that we'll talk about and we'll see this in MetaboAnalyst. And, and we'll use, and MetaboAnalyst does the same thing, it uses normalizing and scaling in the same term, <laughs> um, where in some cases means log transformations for normal distributions, in other case it means scaling to adjust for dilution effects. Okay, we're going to switch over to another part which is uh, data comparisons and dependencies, which is another part of statistics. Um, and, and this is one that is very common in metabolomics and every other omics study. It's very common in modeling, it's very common in, in, in 
computer data analysis. Uh, we want to know something about before and after with a treatment or an intervention. We want to measure one variable depending on another. We want to how an observed property matches with a predicted property. Um, in all these cases, we're usually working with many, many samples. Dozens, 30 minimum, hundreds more typically. When we do that kind of dependency measurement, the standard way to do it is through a scatter plot. So this is a scatter plot of the relationship between a husband's age and a wife's age. And so in this case, the question is, do men and women of the same age typically marry? Intuitively, we'd say that's usually the case. The graph to our eyes confirms it, but then how can we quantify that? This is where statistics is useful. Um, and the way that we can sort of measure this relationship between predicted and observed, before and after, whatever, um, is through uh, calculation of the correlation. So that graph between husband's age and wife's age is positively correlated. If we were trying to you know, correlate husband's age and um, uh, distance to the equator, uh, we might find something that's completely uncorrelated. Um, if we reversed one of the ages uh, and had one going from positive to negative, the other one from negative to positive, we could get a, a negative correlation. They're still correlated, it just happens that the slope is negative instead of positive. I think most of us can recognize when something is highly correlated, the cluster in the data uh, on these cluster scatter pots is, is tight. Uh, a perfect correlation gives us a perfectly straight line. You should never see this in physics or biology or chemistry. Um, and then there are low correlations. These are the things that you typically get when you do psychology measurements. Um, there's a fair bit of scatter. Um, the quantitation of correlation coefficient is, is or correlation is through the correlation coefficient. It's called the Pearson correlation coefficient. This is the formula for calculating it. It has a, a number or a letter associated with which is R. And so given these things, we could actually assign a number. So the one on the left has a correlation coefficient of 0.85, which is pretty good. The one in the middle, correlation of 0.4, which is not so good. And then the perfect correlation coefficient is 1. So it's essentially a measure of the variation um, compared to uh, the expected slope. So as I say, there's the linear coefficient of linear correlation, the Pearson product moment correlation, that's the most common one. There's another one called the Spearman correlation coefficient. That's less commonly used, but it is quantitative. It's the way many, many people use, compare predictions, simulations, and all kinds of data dependencies. There is an issue, though, uh, if you use Microsoft Excel, which most of us do, and you use the plot, it produces a graph with scatter data, and it will calculate not the correlation coefficient, but the thing called the coefficient of determination. It presents R squared. And that's, I think it's, well, it's a bug, but they've never fixed it, and unfortunately it's become common use. So people quote R squared, and they often quote this as the correlation coefficient. It's not. It's also wrong. Um, the way that Pearson intended was he wanted people to use the correlation coefficient. And that's what you should quote, and that's what you should use. So take the square root um, and quote that. Now, there's also an issue of when is a correlation significant? So here's something where we've got, you know, maybe 200 data points, the correlation is 0.85. Is that significant? Here's when we've got three data points, and you've got a great correlation coefficient, 0.99. Um, could you publish that? In some cases, you start collecting more data, in this case where we have the three data points, which are great, and you do two more experiments, and you show that. Uh, the two data points are now in red, and so your correlation went from perfect to abysmal. So this is an example where, again, collecting typically more than 30 points is critical. Um, and 
there are a few tricks that people have done where A, they just show three data points and say, look, my model's perfect, or my data is, is wonderful. They can also do another trick, which is only collecting data at the extreme ends. Um, so you might have a lot of data that you've collected at one point, and then you collect a few other data points at an extreme situation. And they say, oh, now, thanks to that, I get a, a fantastic correlation of 0.95. But you've left out all the other data in between, and normally that will reduce your correlation coefficient. Some people are very selective in the data that they choose. Uh, I don't like that point, I don't like that point, I don't like that point. They toss out 197 points and they keep the three ones and they get this perfect correlation. That's also incorrect. So you can actually use a t-test um, to assess the statistical significance of correlations. So correlations can be quoted with, with essentially a p-value or t-test value, and whether the slope is statistically different than zero. Um, so that is another way of essentially quantitatively assessing whether this is a really decent correlation and whether this, you've got enough data to make a statement about that correlation. There are other things that you can see um, with correlation plots. Sometimes you'll get a wonderful looking correlation, then you'll see these outliers. Some of those outliers are uh, a measurement error, a typographical error, um, but it depends on this experiment and depends on the situation. So sometimes those outliers, in fact, are, are very important. Um, they may represent um, uh, a substantial change in physiology or gene expression or whatever you happen to be measuring. And in the case of microarray experiments, that's usually what you're looking for, uh, are the outliers, uh, the things that are different than the rest. Um, so as I say, outliers can be good, sometimes it can be bad. Obviously if you're doing things like modeling, uh, it means your model is kind of messed up. Uh, but looking for outliers is also a way of seeing if you've messed up in your typing, uh, measurement, recording, whatever else. Um, if it's looking at, you know, metabolite concentrations between two groups or another, one of these outliers could be an indicator. It's a biomarker for something. Um, so it can be useful for looking at significance. <coughs> so we've looked at correlations. Here's a scatter plot again. I think most of us realize there's a correlation between height and weight. So this might be for a collection of rodents, and we can see that uh, we've got this you know, rough relationship between the height and weight of, of these um, bipedal rodents. And so you can calculate a correlation coefficient, and it's pretty decent, and it tells you something about physiology. But you can also do something else with that data, and you can cluster it. And if you knew what you were measuring, you might also see, well, all the ones that were in that cluster, at least that were visible to our eyes, were all the males, and then the pink one, those are mostly females. So rather than trying to correlate, which, yes, height and weight are reasonably correlated, <coughs> clustering would have allowed us to identify something probably more useful, which is these rodents have very distinct populations in terms of, of, of physiology and males, or sexual dimorphism uh, between males and females. So clustering is another technique, in addition to correlation, that we use in statistics in bioinformatics and cheminformatics. So it's widely used in metabolomics, it's widely used in microarrays, it's widely used in proteomics. We use it in phylogenetic and evolutionary analysis, we use it in classifying protein structures, the grouping sequence families. So it's ubiquitous. It is essential to, to essentially all parts of, of biological statistics. So clustering is a way that we group things that are logically similar. So if we are sorting socks from the laundry, we are clustering. It's a little different than classification. Um, usually a classification, some things are labeled. Um, um, they might, in the case of if it's sorting socks, you might say, uh, this sock goes with that sock. Each of them has a label, so someone went through with tape and labeled it for you that's what you're doing, versus sorting socks in the laundry, you're, you're trying to judge by shape, color, um, age, whether they're supposed to be uh, joined together or not. Clustering can help inform whether you should classify things and how they should be classified. 
um, but it, they are distinct things. So the clustering process requires a measure of similarity. So you can use the sequence similarities or dissimilarity, or coefficients of dissimilarity you can calculate. And you also need a threshold uh, to say, this passes my test, therefore I cluster them. And you need to be able to, with the dissimilarity coefficients, to be able to measure that distance between clusters. If you are sorting laundry and sorting or pairing socks, usually you have to start with one sock first. So usually you start with a seed, and that starts the whole process. So there are three different types of clustering algorithms that are used. One is called k-means, so it's uh, sort of clustering by dividing. Then there's the hierarchical uh, clustering, which is more frequently used in biology. And so you're trying to get a progressive nesting of clusters or groups. And the last one is, is more computationally based. That's self-organizing feature maps. And so clustering through training, machine learning, if you want. So the k-means algorithm, or partitioning method, is you first of all grab an object, and you identify that object as your center for the first cluster. Um, and you calculate, grab another object, and calculate its similarity to that center. And if it's just one cluster, then it's just to that one, one centroid. If that passes this similarity um, threshold, then you can put the cluster or join the two. Once you've joined the two, then you calculate a new center from the two objects. And then you go back and grab another object and see if they should cluster or not. If they don't pass the threshold, they can't join that group. Repeat again. So this is how you might do k-means if you had different <laughs> colored balls. And so you might choose one, uh, determine if anything's uh, so the center is its color. Then you choose another and determine based on this rule if it's within 50 nanometers of the absorbance wavelength of the first cluster or the center that you've got, you join them. In this case, it passed, and so you're able to join those two bluish turquoise balls together. You could try it for the other ones, and probably the other three wouldn't fit. So you now have essentially four clusters, two with two objects, and then one, uh, three with one object each. Hierarchical clustering is a little different. In this case, it's, it's sort of a finding and merging until everything has been merged. Um, so that essentially you've got one cluster, but they are sort of ranked. So in that case, uh, you don't just randomly grab one. You actually do a complete pairwise comparison to everything. And it's only after you've done all these pairwise comparisons that then you choose the closest pair. And then you choose the next closest pair, and then you choose the next closest pair, and the next one. And eventually you assemble a large tree, uh, which is in this case the hierarchical cluster. And this is how heat maps can often be generated, or it's how evolutionary phylogenetic trees of sequences can be generated. Um, so in the end, in hierarchical clustering, you've essentially joined everything into one massive single tree, but there are many branches. The branch lengths tell you how close or how distant things are. So as I say, hierarchical clustering is generally the preferred route for many biological clustering things. So that's clustering. So we've done clustering, we've done distributions, we've done t-tests, we've done uh, ANOVA analysis of variants, we've talked about correlation. These are all pieces of the puzzle that allow us to do the big thing, which is multivariate statistics. So again, just like univariate statistics, we can start with a population. But instead of just measuring one variable, height, we're actually going to be measuring, in this population, many variables. We're going to measure their height, their weight, their hair color, clothing color, eye color, and everything else. In the case of metabolomics, we could be measuring all the metabolites in their blood. So there's 50, 100 different compounds that we might be measuring there. 
So in this case, because we're measuring more than just height or more than just one metabolite, we are now doing multivariate statistics. Um, we also have to do, uh, well, as part of the multivariate statistics, do a fair bit of uh, what's called multidimensional or dimensional reduction analysis. On top of that, when we do metabolomics experiments, we'll, we'll not only look at a population, in this case a bunch of people or a bunch of rats, we may also do uh, technical uh, measurements, which we'll call technical replicates. So the intent when we have these populations of, in this case it was 30 cases, 30 controls, those 30 cases are supposed to be resembling replicates. They're supposed to be somewhat similar to each other, we hope. Healthy people should be roughly metabolically similar. But there's variation. And then with our equipment, we also expect that our equipment's going to reproduce exactly the same measurement over and over again. And I think we all know that doesn't happen either. So in many cases, we design our experiments both to have biological replicates, that's the point of having 30, 40, 50 cases, and technical replicates, which might say that we're going to collect a couple samples from each person. So that's a, a part we'll, re, we'll touch on again uh, later on in, in the course, but that's a bit of a segue or diversion. Um, so whether it's um, a few metabolites or hundreds of metabolites, whether it's using multiple instruments or one instrument, um, we're basically dealing with multiple variables. To make multivariate statistics work, make it feasible, we want to change the data from multivariate data to mostly univariate data. Once you can convert the uni things to univariate data, then you can apply the t-tests and the ANOVA and all the other things that we understand or have just learned about. So to convert multidimensional data to one or two or three dimensional data, um, we use a thing called dimension reduction. So in mathematical terms, we talk about many variables as dimensions, x, y, z, three dimensions, a through z, 26 dimensions. Um, so if we have 100 metabolites, that's 100 dimensions. The technique for doing dimension reduction is called principal component analysis. So most people have probably heard of PCA. Um, but as I say, it is a, a mathematical process that tries to uh, identify generally correlated variables into a smaller number of uncorrelated variables. So height and weight are correlated. So technically you could put that into a single variable. Um, uh, so if it's done correctly, it is possible to do a PCA and take literally thousands of variables and reduce them into two or three features. They won't represent, in metabolomics, they won't represent single metabolites, they'll represent some sum of metabolites. These represent features. <coughs> so We've seen this actually before, but this is a more detailed example. Here's a three spectra, three different rat samples. Um, each of these have hundreds of peaks. Uh, we can have, in this case, maybe 30 different samples. In this case, 30 controls, four PAPs, and five or four or five ANITs. But these are their treatments. Um, and so we can take all of that spectral data and we can see that there are three clusters. The other thing that you should also be able to do just with your eyes, you don't have to be an NMR expert or a mass spec expert, you can see just by looking at the spectra that these three look very different. So what PCA is doing is what you can almost intuitively do or naturally do with your eyes. So Generally, PCA captures what you should be able to visually detect. 
if you can't see those differences from some of your data, and again, if it gets really complicated, you maybe you can't, but this is some NMR data, and, and you don't have to be an NMR wizard to say these three spectra are very different. Uh, and if you looked at 40 of the PAPs together or 40 of the ANITs together, you'd find they all look pretty much the same. Um, so you would be able to cluster them quite naturally just <coughs> through intuition. All that PCA is doing is making it mathematically formal. If to your eyes you can't see any difference, if all of them looked identical to the PAP spectrum, PCA is not going to help. All it's going to show is they're all one giant cluster. So how can we think of principal component analysis? Well, one way is to think of this idea of projecting shadows. So let's take a three-dimensional object. We can take a, a bagel or a donut, and we have it sort of hanging by a wire, and we're going to work in a sort of dark little box, and we have two flashlights. And what we're trying to do here is work on projections. So one way happens that we shine the, the flashlight onto the bagel in one direction, and it produces a shadow that looks like a, an O. And then we use our flashlight and shine it on, and we get a projection on the other uh, wall. Again, it's a two-dimensional projection that looks like a, a sausage or a wiener. One projection is more informative than the other. If I saw someone drew the shadow picture of, of the, the O and said, what, what kind of uh, pastry do you think this is? I would guess donut or bagel. If someone showed me the object uh, on your, your right, which looks like a sausage, and I said, what kind of pastry is that? I might say that it's, uh, it's not a pastry, it's a hot dog or something, or a hot dog bun, and I'd be wrong. So one projection is more informative than the other. The most informative projection is called the principal component one. It's the one that has the largest eigenvector, has the most information in it. The one that's less informative um, is the principal component two. Um, it does give you some dimensional data about how this donut is, is, or this bagel actually has some depth to it. So that's taking a three-dimensional object, projecting it into two dimensions. We could have a five-dimensional object and project it into two dimensions. You can do that mathematically. It's not so easy to do it with flashlights and, and uh, boxes. But that's the concept, that's the essence of principal component analysis. It just happens that how they've chosen the axis, but your principal, their main, most important eigenvalue, eigenvector, is the one with the largest value. Okay, so one, two doesn't really... No, it doesn't, the labeling just happens to, if they always say the x-axis is PC2 and the y-axis is always PC1, then it, however they've chosen to do it. But it's the, it's the principal component, and usually the most they'll show is three principal components, but the one that has the largest weight or score is the one that's most important, that's the most, most um, critical value. So when they do the algorithm, they just assign a, a value to it? There's a weight to that, to that eigenvalue, and it's, it's, it's essentially that's, well, it's, it's the size or the magnitude of the eigenvalue. So you're trying to explain very complex things with essentially a minimal set of, of components, and, and the size of the eigenvalue um, is, is the one that is determining which ones are the most component. And if you've done a good job, and if the data is fairly clear, there's only about three or four significant eigenvalues that you, you'll find in most data. Uh, in some cases it's just two. In some cases it's just one. And if it's only one eigenvalue that's significant, then you should have been able to see the data right away um, that they were different. Um, 
Um, they scale them so that it's proportion, so they calculate it, so it's 50% of the total of all the eigenvalues. So, so if you have n dimensions, you should have n eigenvalues. You should. That's right. But you'll find that the eigenvalues start falling off precipitously. Um, so the amount of projection there is. Yeah, tiny, tiny. <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah. And then they calculate the That's right. So formally, what you're doing with PCA is you're transforming data to a new coordinate system. So you're rotating it um, in two dimensions, or three dimensions, or four dimensions to sort of maximize the variance of the data. And so you identify the one that as the maximal variance on one coordinate, the second greatest cor variance on the second coordinate. And so a two-dimensional PCA plot just plots two PCA, two PCs. A three-dimensional PCA plot plots the three most significant ones. Mathematically, what you're doing is called a singular value decomposition. So that's a linear algebra trick. It's not easy to do by hand. Um, but it takes, in this case, our data matrix, which might have our samples, so 30 or 40 human samples, and then 100 or so metabolites, so it's a 30 by 100 matrix. And we're going to decompose that matrix into a set of eigenvectors, which we call scores, and a set of loadings, which we call p's. And then the data, which are those coordinates, are related to your scores through that equation there. So the T1 score is equal to the loading times, say, the concentration of alanine plus the concentration of this P2 loading, um, might, might be citrate or something like that. So these are how we've essentially converted our data into uh, a collection of what we call scores and loadings. This is something you guys don't have, but um, it just I thought it would be helpful to help so this singular value decomposition is to take your data matrix on the left and to break it down into these three other uh, matrices, one of which is in the middle, is S or sigma, uh, which is sort of these eigenvalues. Um, a more realistic or understandable example is, okay, I can always show you matrices, but you can take examples of Phil Mickelson, Tiger Woods, and Vijay Singh as their golfers. And here's their golfing score on the first nine holes uh, for um, Sunday's PGA. Um, and you can actually, in essence, uh, predict what their score should be based on the difficulty of the hole, player skill, and then a scaling factor. So if we take those three tables or three matrices and multiply them out, we would get their scores. So we could, in essence, predict their scores. What we're doing in singular value decomposition is we're taking their whole scores uh, and decomposing it into those three matrices. So it's kind of the reverse. Um, but there's information, obviously, in those three matrices, and those are the ones that we're wanting to do with PCA analysis. Another way of understanding PCA uh, is to take an example that Roy Goodacre gave a number of years ago, which I think is still one of the best ones. So for some reason, someone gave him uh, airport data. Um, and uh, this was data that included the latitude, longitude, and altitude of every airport in the United States. There's actually 5,000 airports. And this included the airports in Alaska and Hawaii and then the continental US. And I'm not sure why they wanted to do this, but they said, can you do some cluster analysis? Um, I wanted, can you do a PCA analysis to see if there's sort of this an interesting relationship between airports and, and their altitude and maybe their latitude? Um, okay, so you take the data and you crunch through it. This is the PCA plot. So if you look at it closely, you can see that it includes uh, or represents a cluster. And the cluster is the continental United States. There's Florida, this is California, 
Texas. Uh, this is Puerto Rico, this is Hawaii, and that's Alaska. There's not as many airports in Alaska, but you can see the general shape of Alaska. And the PC analysis you know, doesn't produce a shape of the US the way they standardly draw it. It's a little crooked. But that's what uh, the first and second principal components gave. And that's latitude and longitude. There is no other relationship between latitude plus longitude or latitude plus altitude minus whatever. It's just those are the two most obvious things. And then in the corner is this relationship between altitude and, um, um, I think, longitude. And it produces something bizarre. Not really sure what it is. But the point is that what PCA is, uh, and this has been proven mathematically, is it's k-means clustering. So I've already mentioned what k-means clustering is that's this grouping of balls and deciding how things should be joined. So um, that's what, what, what PCA fundamentally is. Uh, is, is a clustering algorithm uh, and it's fundamentally k-means clustering. And in this case the PCs didn't come up with some linear combination, they just came up as, as the direct variables latitude and longitude primarily. Um, once you've been able to do this dimensional reduction, uh, you will end up with clusters of data. So we saw clusters of the continental US, clusters of Alaska, clusters of Hawaii, uh, in PCA space. And you can use things like t-tests and ANOVAs if you want to determine if these clusters are significant. So we usually use visual cues to say whether these clusters correspond to things. Uh, and most of us still continue to do that. Most of us just draw circles and say this is a cluster here. But you can be a little more statistically significant or useful by using things like ANOVA to determine whether those clusters are, are significantly uh, grouped together or not. One question, just taking a step back. Um, yeah. Can you give us the example of the golf example with yeah. this time PCA? I was wondering if you may have a perspective on how to describe that in metabolism's terms. Like if you had metabolite concentrations and you were trying to so what are the three components likely to represent and is there any Yeah, so this would be that? well yeah. So this is Phil's metabolome, Hydra's metabolome, and PJ's metabolome, uh -huh. negative concentrations for alanine citrate, uh phenylalanine, adenine or something like that. Yeah. Uh -huh. So those are there. Uh -huh. Um then there's in this one you might be decomposing it into that's going to be a score matrix and a low matrix we are going to be see on the other one is. So it's it's exactly the full matrix. One is score matrix, one is matrix. Because the score is to be floated. I don't know if they one would be multiplied. I think it's gonna be this. Yeah. The score matrix the only matrix problem is uh, two sides. So and then in the middle, you calculate the eigen vector, so the high stays the first one. So this is, uh, yeah, this is uh, if you really want to see the internal PCA, this is uh, how we calculate the uh, yeah, loading, loading, which feature is more important, and uh, uh, which feature driving is the separation, so it's small and loading. And I was wondering if there's sort of a, a so this synonymous, just as in this particular case, the score uh, would be the whole thing and loading the loading be a player ability. Do you have anything? Yeah, so that. We'll, we'll talk about that. I'll, I'll, I'll get to that just in a, a second. So I'll, we'll, we'll get to that very shortly. Um, so basically, um, this is this idea of scores and loadings. Um, so the cluster plot that we saw showing, say, the US uh, is a scores plot. And it replots the data um, showing these different principal components. 
in the Tiger Woods Vijay Singh thing, it would be the weight of the eigen vectors and the set of the eigen vectors that probably would be a combination of I don't know, whole difficulty and player ability if you want. The other thing that's produced that isn't as frequently shown in, in papers is called the loading spot. So that's showing you how much of each uh, of, say, the variables, metabolites, contributed to the different principal components. So these are all the metabolites. Glutamine, citric acid, leucine, serine, so they'll all be labeled. Some of them aren't, but they were identified. Um, and if we were looking at our scores plot, and we saw that things were separated, let's say that they're just for the sake of argument. There was one cluster that was here, and another cluster way at the top corner, just for the sake of argument. The things that were driving that separation of those two clusters are identifiable through here. So in this case, it's phosphate and malic, <coughs> which are one extreme. They're driving that. And then oxoproline and maybe asparagine were the ones that were driving the other one, the upper corner. Um, so by partly almost superimposing your um, scores plot with your loading spot, you can actually figure out which metabolites <coughs> were driving or pulling the clusters apart. So it's a, a visual way for you to sort of reinterpret some of that data. And there are other ways you'll see in metabolite analysis that also identify uh, which ones are driving the separation or moving those clusters apart. So in this plot, I use principal plots two and three, which are normally not one and two. And you would normally do one and two. Yeah. Uh, I must say that there's a little bit of a difference. If we had a three-dimensional PCA thing like what's here, that's three Ds, then you're kind of stuck trying to do one projection, then another projection. But yeah, normally, most people are just happy with two dimensions. And yes, it would be normally principal component one and principal component two. So which metrics would correspond to that? You're talking about the single value decomposition? Yeah, the, the, the mathematical. So are those reflecting the... They're a little more complicated. So this is... <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, so that's... As I say, there's a single value decomposition, but normally what we're ending up trying to do is, is putting this thing. Scores, loading data. Okay, so you've got the, the, the parameters that come out from the... From the that value. you have resolved the, yeah. the, the difference. So the SCB, I still don't know, it's not really clear to talk them by the computer now, um, is a way that these things are decomposed. Right. But which one ends up getting labeled as a score, which one ends up getting labeled as loading, is not clear to me, because at some level, the SCD principles also are conceptually equivalent to the PCA decomposition, but they end up using different nomenclature. Oh. Um, so the picture, as I said, that I showed of the SCD, that's the one that's best explained. So that's why I sort of default to, OK, let's just talk about the SCD. And they are equivalent. But I still think that the most intuitive understanding um, is. So that uh, PCA is a classic one. You can uh, the data so you can really calculate manually. But as it is, basically what I often do, put the inside, but it's faster. So from the awareness, we use SVD. So that's why I'm saying it's equivalent to loading and score. But internally, you can sweep almost. But the, the picture they showed about loading and score, that's exactly classic. Uh, so we're just about done, um, and I think uh, I'll, in the last few minutes here, we'll just try to wrap up and we'll break for lunch. Um, I mean, these are tough concepts, and I think they're good questions, but 
uh, part of it is just we're trying to get a conceptual understanding um, and understanding again the in intuition behind it. Say, okay, here's my plot. What do I? How do I interpret it? What's it doing? And I think most people find uh, two or three slides that are most useful. One being the uh, the bagel projection thing uh, is often the most intuitive understanding of why we and how we do dimensional reduction. And then the other one that most people find most useful is the uh, PCA plot of airports um, and, and how things essentially simplify. So again, PCA is sometimes a fairly intuitive process. It's just mathematically formalized. Uh, in many cases, our brains can do it, but again, it's more intuition. Generally, um, people will use PCA as a, an initial foray to see if their data is, is, is useful and is able to give them some separation. Um, and some people look at you know first and second, second and third, third and fourth, and by the time they're going to you know the eleventh and twelfth principal component, and they're seeing some kind of weak separation. Um, basically, all is lost at that point. Um, if you can't distinguish with a PCA plot, then it's usually a hint that that nothing that you'll be doing could distinguish between those samples. Um, Hitting it with more statistics, trying to look at more obscure principal components, again, not, not something you should do. Now, sometimes PCA will give you a hint, and not a strong hint, um, but it still gives you a hint. And this is when people will start using another technique called partial least squares discriminant analysis. This is not a clustering technique, it's a classification technique. It requires that the data has to be labeled. And what it is equivalently doing is taking what you might have been able to get from a PCA and further maximizing that separation. So it's using a bit, a di a bit more information because you've labeled things and you're saying, you know, healthy, sick. And PCA says there's not much of a difference, but now you've labeled it and so in essence, the program can say, oh, okay, I'm supposed to distinguish between healthy and sick, so I'll, I'll play around with the variables a little more and stretch out things. Um, so you rotate coordinates even further with that. But PLSDA is a prediction, uh, whereas PCA is just simply class, uh, clustering. So when you make predictions, uh, you can actually sort of overtrain and overfit. Uh, you're telling it, here's, here's the answer, uh, now make it look good. And it's sort of, if you give someone the answer key for a test and have them take the test, they should do very well. Then you give them a new test without the answer key, they may not do so well. So this is the example of sort of overtraining. So there are different ways of assessing whether your PLSDA has actually been cheating too much or overtrained. So one way is to use what are called R-squared and Q-squared assessments. The other one is called permutation testing. So R-squared is that same thing. That's the correlation index. It's not correlation coefficient. It refers to the goodness of fit. Ranges from 0 to 1. Um, Q-squared is the predict predicted variation or quality of it. And it also ranges from 0 to 1. And basically, R-squared and Q-squared should match reasonably well. They, they track with each other. Um, so just like with correlation coefficients or correlation indices, an R squared of 0.2 or 0.3 is pretty crummy. An R squared of 0 0.7, 0 0.8, that's pretty good. Same thing with Q squared. If it's 0 0.2, 0 0.3, that's pretty crummy. Uh, if it's more than 0 0.5, typically, that's pretty good. Uh, 0.9, almost never seen. So it's kind of a cross-validation uh, assessment. You can calculate Q-squared partly through permutation testing. Um, Metaboanalyst calculates R-squareds and Q-squareds. But um, my preference uh, is actually just do permutation testing. 
That's the most robust way of doing it. R squared and Q squared are kind of inventions of um, eumetrics. Um, so it's not classical standard statistical stuff. But um, permutation testing is, is ubiquitous in, in the field of both machine learning and now more and more in statistics. So what is permutation? So this is the other key slide that you guys need to be aware of. So let's say you've got a PCA uh, analysis. So this is, things are unlabeled. And initially it looks like there's no real separation. So we're going to quit our job and become tax evaders. But the other option is say, okay, let's say we look at the labeled data. So there's going to be blue and orange or red. And once this stuff is labeled, then you can say, that, yeah, there is a bias. It's not a perfect separation. And maybe if we were plotting this in three dimensions, the separation is a little stronger. But you can see that the red is sort of separated and the blue is higher up. So there's something clustering, but it still requires that we labeled it. Um, if we run the PLSDA with the data, it has this little bit more information. So now it's going to rotate things a little bit more. And in fact, back to PLSDA, we actually see this nice separation. So hooray, we're going to keep with our job. But what you want to do next is test to see whether that was just uh, luck or happenstance, or that the PLSA didn't learn how to cheat. So what you do, or what computation has done, is you relabel all the data manually. So this is your first relabeling, and it's a cost of so this top one used to be blue, now you say it's red. This bottom one used to be blue, now you say it's red. And then the other ones are also switched. So everything is switched. So you have this relabel thing, permuted. Then you run PLSDA on this one. And it grinds away for half an hour, and it says, here's what I do. And uh, this isn't separated. OK? Now let's relabel again. This one is red, and this one is red. This one's blue, and that one's blue, but this one's red. We relabel, and then we send it to the machine, and it calculates another PLS, it grinds away, grinds away. It says, ta-da, still no separation. And what you can do is you can kind of measure the level of separation, um, different ways of doing it. And what you do is you track that score, how well things are separated. So this first one, you get a great separation. The next two, the next three, the next four separations, it's so good. So you can start plotting if you want the separation score. And so it turns out that if this one, which is up here, is so well separated, everything else that you've done, and you've got hundreds and hundreds of mutations <coughs> and relabeling, they all look like this. Then you can say, you know what? This is significant. And based on the number of times that you've commuted, if you've commuted or relabeled a thousand times, and this one's still out there, you can say that this is significant at a p-value of 1 over 1,000, 0 0.001. The one with the arrows represents that, the one at the top. Yeah, this, oh. that's the one with the arrow. Rosa. OK, and the other ones are the, the other permute data, the, the OK. Yeah, so you'll do this many hundreds of times, or the Pebble analysts or any software will do this. And it re, re, redoes it, it's quite good. Of course, none of us would do this by hand, because we'd be <laughs> <laughs> So permutation types for the computers, we can do this. And so it generally generates, in essence, synthetic experiments, yes. And, and you get this distribution to determine whether that, that separation that you're seeing. And you have like this Gaussian. Yeah. Yeah. It just determines if it is an outlier or not in respect to the, to the distribution that it would be if I'm exchanging it. That's right. So it's the most robust and intuitive way of doing it. So I don't like R squared Q squared. I like permutation data as a rule. And uh, it's, it's very calculable. It's a very robust test. You can permute if you want to have a p-value of 0 0.00001. You can permute a million times if you want a p-value of, of of 0 0.05, you can permute 20 or 30 times. So you know you can change it, give your level of significance or your alpha. 
Um, but this is also, it's not unheard of. This is the sort of thing that you'll see where the PCA just doesn't give you quite what you expect, but then going to that next step, PLSD does seem to give you something a little better. And um, obviously there are other techniques you can use, um, whether it's PLSD, you can go to support vector machines, random forest, naive bays, neural networks. These are all classification techniques that are commonly used. These are also available uh, through Metabolanist, as you guys will see. If you are trying to attack uh, your data and clear the data barrier wall, there's a, an approach. Um, we start with the small itinerary and move up to the heavier guns and then the giant guns. And the small itinerary is, is the PCA clustering. Uh, hopefully if that works, you're through. <coughs> Great. If it doesn't, then you bring in a heavier gun. This is your PLSDA regression methods to use. <coughs> saw that in the previous slide where it did help. Sometimes PLSD doesn't quite do a good job and so you can use machine learning techniques which are a little, a little smarter about separating things or identifying and sometimes that will be sufficient. So there's this progression. So you should see if there's, uh, you know, first of all if there's some natural clusters that form that's great, you're, you're, you've probably got great data to work with. So there's, clustering isn't that obvious, then you can bring in some of these uh, supervised machine learning methods, uh, classification, PLSDA, neural nets, other things. But once you are doing those supervised methods, you have to assess uh, whether these are significant, and that's where this permutation test, or R squared, Q squared, is important. So the supervised methods like PLSDA, SVMs, neural nets, everything, um, are very powerful, and, and people get uh, enamored with them so much so that they actually skip the PCA, and they shouldn't. And that's when people start making errors. And in many cases, people will do PLSDA straight off and won't do the permutation testing. That's another major error. In the end, um, if you can't see separations from PCA, uh, or by eyeballing some of the data, or just looking at it before straight going to a computer, um, then no matter what you do, it, it's, it's going to essentially give you insignificant results. So again, it goes back to the, almost the first slide. Statistics is the mathematics of impressions or the mathematics of intuition. So always look at your data. Uh, the trends should be present, reasonably obvious. If they aren't to your eyes, then the statistics aren't going to fish it out for you. They rarely do. So that's it for statistics, and I think it's lunchtime now. <laughs>